Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Junkyard Dogcast. Got the whole crew with us this week. I'm Jordan Hill. We got Rusty Mansell and Kip Adams. Uh, guys, we're coming to the uh, fans one day before fall camp starts for the Georgia Bulldogs. Going to be a very busy week to kind of set up a very busy month as Georgia gets ready to kick things off against Oregon. Start with you, Rusty. How's this Wednesday treating you? As we're right around the corner from the start of camp. I'm I'm here. I can quit wearing striped shirts. This look weird on to y'all. It looks I mean, all right on my end. What do they like, say about vertical stripes? And... I, yeah, I can't. I, I guess I'm gonna do away with all stripes. Uh, I apologize if that's got anybody looking. I, I'm like, man, does that look rough? Or, so no, I'm excited, man. Uh, college football, it, it's here, and um, you know, good buddy ours kept knows him well as Martin Simmons. Text him. Couple of days last week, they've been in camp for a week now. I didn't realize they play Hawaii um, the week before Georgia plays Oregon. So there was already some fall camps, the SEC going, but it's a little different vibe. Um, talking season is definitely over, and it's time to buckle up and let's get after this thing. Kip, uh, how about you? Just how's things treating you before we really kind of get the nose to the grindstone and get ready for this 2022 season? Let's crank it up. I've watched enough TV shows this off season. I've caught up. You know, we got uh, what two episodes left to better call Saul. I'm ready. Uh, knock those out and, and get ready for football. I mean, it's it's the greatest season in the world, and uh, this one's going to be a fun one. I think it's just. I mean, I, it's probably an evergreen statement, but I just think it's just really interesting going into the fall. Uh, a lot of intriguing teams and coaching situations and. Ready to see who emerges. I mean, uh, coming into this, we, you know, this time last year, just the the players that emerged for for Georgia during the season, and you know, we talked about guys that we had high expectations for. But I uh, just, you know, ready to see who who shows out, not just in fall camp, but obviously, the first game, we're going to learn a lot about Georgia as, as we we do now often under Kirby Smart. He likes that first game to be a good one, and I think this one's going to be a pretty good one for the dogs. A lot to learn, a lot to look out for once they get into camp. So, yeah, today we decided, especially with camp a day away, it would be a good time for Mailbag to answer some questions from the board, uh, get a chance to talk a little bit about you know what we know, what we're expecting, and what we want to see uh, coming out of fall camp. So I tell people who are watching this live, too, feel free to throw some questions in the comments. We're going to do our best to also – uh, jump in on there and answer people who are watching this live. Uh, but we'll go through some of these questions. We can each take turn kind of uh, filling out what we think. Uh, go with the first question from Go and Postal Ringo, who says, does Jalen Carter have a suit type season where he is unblockable all the time? Uh, I'll start and throw this one to Kip and then Rusty, you can chime in. But, you know, I went back and looked at the Dominican Sue's tw uh, 2009 season, 85 tackles. Uh, 20 and a half tackles for a loss, 12 sacks. I think Jalen's going to be good. I don't know if anybody in this day and age is going to be as good as Sewell. I still think he probably should have won the Heisman the year with the season he had at Nebraska. Uh, but, Kip, what's your take on that? What kind of season Jalen Carter may be looking at? <laughs> no pressure, Jalen. Uh, it's You know, it's tough because we saw the guys Georgia had on the defensive line last year, and obviously that – you know, the first round NFL draft was an testament to that. But, yeah, I think uh, Jalen Carter had an outstanding, uh, you know, sophomore season coming in there. And, and a lot of people say most talented defensive lineman on the, in that group last year. But he's not going to have those guys, you know, on the team next to him this year. Georgia's got a lot of talent on defense, but a lot of young guys, guys that still need to step into the, into the role. So as we go into camp, you know, I can't project that kind of season for Jalen Carter. One, he's not going to be asked to do the same things. He's not going to be just set loose to wreak havoc. He's going to have assignments to play in Kirby Smart scheme. And he's going to have double and dribble teams. He's going to get a lot of what, you know, Jordan Davis got last year is the guy that they know is the most disruptive player on that defense. They're going to make sure that they try to account for that. So he's going to have plenty of guys – you know, uh, trying to put hands on him. He's going to have to earn every stat he can. So while I think, you know, he's set up to have a, a great season, he's going to make a lot of plays because he's an outstanding player and probably the best defensive lineman, the interior defensive lineman in college football. But uh, he's going to have to earn all of them. So I, I think you're looking at one of the most, if not the most statistically dominant defensive season from a lineman 
you know, uh, in, in the last 10, 20 years at a sub. But I don't, I can't see that for Carter. What I can say is that he's going to be a menace and he's going to allow his teammates to, uh, to probably roam free a lot and make a lot of plays. He's going to create a lot of opportunities for others when he's not in the backfield himself. Rusty, any thoughts on Jalen going into this year? Uh, you know, he's a top five pick right now. So, he, like Kip just says, he'll get double, triple teamed every single play. And he needs guys around him to step up and allow him to be, you know, Jalen Carter and, and dominate and those types of things. I'll be interested to see what kind of, you know, stats he has this year. You know, let's, let's be honest now. It gets a point where you start thinking about, hey, I'm already a top five pick. And, you know, am I taking on this? You know, I mean, what's going on here? So, you know, from everything I've heard, Jalen Carter is a very driven player. He's a guy that's going to uh, give Georgia everything, but he needs some guys around him to help him. You know, the guy barely started last year, which was crazy. I mean, you know, he probably, he probably, Trayvon Walker went number one, and he was probably the number two, I guess, draft prospect on team. Ended up being, I would have bet he was a number one draft prospect at some point last year. So, you know, Jalen Carr needs some guys to help him out. So you don't get into game 12 and game 13 and game 14, and he's, He's tired of getting triple teamed and double teamed and those types of things. So uh, I think Jalen Carter can be as good as Jalen Carter has been at Georgia. He's a special defensive line prospect. I said it right after his class signed that he would be the first player taken out of his class. Everyone I talked to that saw him, particularly that spring of going into his senior year, uh, converted tight end, kind of a late bloomer because he moved over uh, to defensive line. But everybody I've talked with, uh, you watch him, he has, a, he has a swim move he uses about four or five times a game, which is so hard to use on the interior. Uh, he did it once in the Alabama game, and literally the guard did not get his hands on him. Uh, the play went the other direction, but he was in the backfield, and the guard was basically standing there like, where do you go? You know, he is that quick off the ball. He's strong. Uh, you know, I, I think you go back and look at the Arkansas game, they put him to fullback, and – they ran behind him, and he absolutely just mauled their their linebacker four or five yards into the end zone. So, explosive guy. Uh, they need Jalen Carter. Jalen Carter needs some people around him to help him uh, because they're getting a point. If he's getting triple teamed on every play, uh, just nature of the beast, man, you'll get frustrated with stuff like that. So, you know, Jalen Carter can be as good as he can be, but he needs others around him to help him as well. We'll be very interested to see guys like Zion Logue, Tyrion Ingram Dawkins, some of those other guys, how they can play if they wind up having those roles starting alongside Jalen. I do think they got guys. They just they're inexperienced. You know, I'm not saying I'm not saying the well's dry by any means. Don't go into panic mode over this, but you know, they need some guys to grow pretty quickly. And they're highly recruited guys. And we think they've got some guys that just need some time. So there's a lot of potential there for this Georgia defense. I'm not saying it's all doom and gloom here. Uh, but Jalen Carter is at peak performance. He's got some guys that's got to grow up around him pretty quickly, and uh, I, I foresee that happening, but we'll, we'll see as the season progresses how things work out for him. We'll kind of toggle back and forth between questions that we pulled from the board and also questions from the live chat. It was kind of interesting, especially me having covered Auburn before I got here. Uh, this question from Brian K. Whitehead, who said, do any of you think Auburn could be three and two or two and three when they come to Athens? They don't have any guaranteed wins on their schedule. I went through and looked at their schedule when this question was asked. They've honestly, I think, got a pretty good shot at being three and two somewhere in there. Really, the only games early before they play Georgia that concerned me from Auburn's perspective is playing Penn State, but you get them at home. I think Auburn's got a chance of winning that game, even with some of the questions they have. And then playing at home again, LSU. I think I would go with LSU in that game. I think that, uh, you know, I think people are kind of a little down on LSU in this first year with Brian Kelly. I still think they would be able to be Auburn. Uh, the thing that really strikes me about Auburn this year, looking at that schedule, they play five straight home games before they come to Athens. All those games to start the year are going to be in Jordan Hare, and that's going to be huge. But the problem is going to be especially when you look at Auburn, where they stand, and, you know, it's no secret that Brian Harson is still on a hot seat there. It's all going to be about how they finish, and they're going to play on the road and, and play uh, Georgia, and then they've got some very tough games down the stretch. I think it's very realistic to Auburn for Auburn to be looking at a situation where they are somewhere around three and two. 
Um, you know, they could even be four and one if they're able to beat Penn State. I'm not convinced about that LSU game, but going to Athens, we know, you know, Georgia uh, has not lost to Auburn Athens since 2005. So I think it's a situation where Auburn better stack up as many wins as they can uh, before they play Georgia, because I think after that, it's going to be a pretty rough stretch. They got Arkansas, Alabama, all those teams left. And I mean, that gauntlet of the West, you know, for me, it's quarterback play. TJ Finley, you know, Zach Calzada, whoever it is. Auburn, Auburn has to have quarterback play. You know, they've had some good guys, had some good players. They just have not been consistent enough there uh, for whatever reason. And uh, they've got to find a way to get that done. If they don't get that done early, uh, whoever's doing it and get some confidence going into, what, like you said, that gauntlet starting at Georgia, in my opinion, it could it could literally be a, a, a slippery slope downhill real quick at Auburn. Kip, any thoughts on Auburn? Yeah, I think I mean they got a couple 50-50 games. You just you you look at that that Penn State game, I think turnovers are gonna be, you know, tell the tale in that one. You know, who who puts up the best pass rush in that game and affects the quarterback. I I mean they they, they have a chance of coming in, you know, either uh you know five and one or you know, at worst, maybe four and two. I think uh that you got to take that if you're Auburn. You know, you have that touch stretch, but you have to have some momentum. You know, uh, the Georgia game is going to be tough for them. I think, you know, you really got to uh, look at that LSU game. It's probably going to dictate just the, the mentality they have coming in. You know, uh, if, if Brian Kelly is able to, to take the secondary play that he has, it's getting better, establish their offensive identity. Uh, that's a 50-50 game that he has a chance to pull away from. And I think if, if Auburn loses that game, they probably – you know, coming to that Georgia week, you know, probably up against it a little bit. And I think that coaching staff's already up against it. There, there's not a lot of turmoil or adversity they're going to be able to face and, and be able to get through it. This is a tough season for him, a program that tried to replace him in the offseason. We haven't really seen that before. How long does that, that, does that last? You know, uh, how many wins can he get to – appease not just the fan base but the the people trying to make decisions you basically had people trying to pull a coup, a coup last season and uh i mean i hadn't seen anything like that before and then a, a failed one at that usually when you get that far it's like okay guys we got to go ahead and do this and somehow they they didn't replace the their head coach when they told everybody that's what they wanted to do so a uh, really interesting situation for auburn and, and honestly they're just not really in a great place overall and and in terms of their talent. I mean, they're, they're still pretty good, but they are not the, the Auburn of, you know, five, six years ago. Uh, they have a deficit of multiple positions that, that you know, it, because of that turmoil, it's effective of them recruiting. They're not, they're not re recruiting at the same level. They're not getting the guys that they used to get. Uh, and so I think it's a really tough uh, situation for Auburn right now. And, and they really need to, to hit on one of their quarterbacks, like Rusty said, because that, I mean, that might get them one or two wins that maybe they, you know, they're not projected to get. And that's exactly what they need uh, for this regime to stay and get some consistency and stability in that program because that's not something they have right now. Yeah, just looking at that situation, even if they survive that coaching staff this year, they're going to need a lot of help as far as recruiting. I know their offensive line depth is a real question after 2022. Uh, we'll take one more question from the board and, and answer it, and then we'll take a, a quick break. Uh, but go to Hog Dog 21 who said, starter at cornerback opposite Keely Ringo. Uh, second part of the question is, what role is Tyke Smith going to have this year? Start with the first question. Based on everything we saw during the spring, I think it's going to be Kamari Lassiter. He seems like you know, a really talented guy, a guy that – you know, they're counting on to step up. He wound up missing G-Day uh, just because of an illness. They just uh, moved William Poole over from nickel and let him play corner for G-Day. Um, but based on everything I've seen, I think it's going to be Kamari. But you got some young guys coming in uh, that are going to try I, to – I, I would I would watch Dalen Everett there. Go for it. Yeah, tell I, us about Dalen. I, I would watch Dalen Everett there. That's a, that's a young man that uh, – now, I'm not calling he's going to start, but I am I'm, I was with you, Jordan, there for a good while. And, and look, we're getting into the summer. And, you know, these summer reps, and you start seeing some things and hear some things. So, you now we're going to put these pads on here in a couple of days. So, we'll find out for sure. Uh, Kamari Lasser is a guy that obviously is very comfortable in the system, knows the system well. Uh, but Dalen Everett is a kid that Georgia recruited extremely hard. Clemson won that battle. And when they had that coaching change, Georgia was the beneficiary of getting him back 
uh, from IMG Academy. And this is a big corner. And that, that's going to be a real interesting battle from everything I hear right now going into August. We'll see what we continue to hear. But uh, that position might be a little bit more open than people think. Kip, your thoughts just on these corners outside of Ringo as they try to figure out who steps up. Well, it, it, you're in a good position. Yeah, you know, you knew when Kamari Lasseter came in. I mean, Kirby Smart singled him out multiple times, and they said we got to find a role for him. I think they'll still find a role for him. They'll make sure that you know he's on the field and, and getting playing time because they know what they have in him. But like Rusty said, it was how huge was it for Dalen Everett to enroll early? You know, this secondary class we we talked about how talented it is on paper. Uh, you know, maybe the most talented we've seen, but you know, Dalen's the the guy that got in there early, got the chance to get acclimated with with the program, went through spring and everything. And I think that was huge for him. And, and we knew one of these guys would probably step up and, and push for playing time early. That was the you know that's why Georgia brought in these guys after having so many guys in the secondary drafted in the last two years. So I just think that. Uh, Dalen Everett has the talent level, and it's good for Georgia. If he's pushing Kamari Lasseter, uh, one of those guys is going to get on the field because they earned it, and that's exactly what Kirby Smart wants, uh, that iron sharpens iron mentality. So I, I think it's good for, for Georgia's secondary, a lot of young guys in there, that they're pushing each other in fall camp because whoever's starting come that Oregon game, he's going to have earned it and, and probably going to be a pretty good player and getting a lot of balls thrown his way. Because we know Keely Ringo on the other side has, has already made a name for himself. So teams are going to test that other cornerback. And I think, you know, you want to have a guy like Dalen Everett in there who's young, confident, and, and, and willing to not worry about maybe messing up on a player or two and, and being aggressive out there. Second part of the question about Tyke Smith. To me, on both sides of the ball, if you look at the defense, he's probably my wild card in the fact that we just got to see what his availability looks like. I asked Kirby – uh, back at SEC Media Day, so that was two weeks ago, just about Ty Key's situation where he was with his health. Um, you know, he said that he was running, you know, that you were seeing progress, but he was still not cleared, um, you know, for football activities, tackle and things like that. And I think sometimes we kind of get caught up. You know, he tore his ACL in October. That was only 10 months ago. You know, I think sometimes we get caught up with guys like George Pickens who can make really, really impressive returns from that injury. You know, I, I'm very interested just to see how much availability Tyke has during fall camp. Uh, you know, I think if he's healthy, you know, he could be a guy that could push uh, William Poole for that nickel job. I mean, that was a job uh, that he did very well at West Virginia. Uh, but I'm kind of in wait and see mode with Tyke just as far as what he's able to do and how much he's going to be able to contribute during fall camp. Yeah, yeah. at this, po at this point, you got to go who, who knows the system. He's behind the eight ball. I mean, he hasn't been able to really get out there. He got out there just for a little bit, you know, in that one game and, and had the injury. Uh, so right now it's just about can he come in and, and pick up the system to, to where they want him to be. And you've had other guys. He got fall camp going. These guys have already been working out there and getting reps. He's lost valuable reps. So I think, you know, when Kirby Smart said we're going to, you know, see if we can find a role for him, I mean, that, that said a lot to me. That means, you know, we got to see what, what we can get out of him. Not just it's not just about starting. Like, what role can we find with him? Because we've got guys out there who we know what we have in him, and I don't think they just they don't know what they have in Tyke Smith yet because he's not out there, he's not available, and I mean he might not have that that role in, the, in that system nailed down right now. So going into fall camp, you, you of course you got to look at William Poole, you got to look at Chris Smith, and I mean you got to look at Dan Jackson and Malachi Starks, just the guys who probably. Uh, have earned the trust of the coaching staff and are out there and, and able to play and, 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 you know, earn those snaps. So going into the season, that's pro you know, you roll with who, you know, what you have. And then, you know, we saw that with William Poole last year, you know, when he was not available at the beginning of the season, he kind of had to earn that role toward the end of the season. And I just think that's kind of where we're at with Tyke Smith. If he comes out there and he's cleared, he, he picks it up quickly. Of course, they'll find a way to get on the field. I just don't think that's the case right now. Rusty, your thoughts on yeah. Tyke? I think he's behind, and like Kip said, you know, it's just he's got to get he's got to get himself healthy and get ready. I'll give you a name that's kind of under the radar a little bit: Javon Bullard, um, guy that young man out of Baldwin County that played a little bit at times last year, and I hear a lot of good things about him in the off season. But um, you know, 
right now, Chris Smith, Dan Jackson, William Poole, uh, you know, those guys really starting to, you know, they're upperclassmen. Uh, they kind of know what's going on in that, in that back end at those safety and star positions and things like that. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, when and how much Tyke Smith can, can get in there. But first of all, you just got to let the young man get healthy and clear to see what exactly he can do. But right now, Georgia has, I think, some really good depth there. Um, and, and I'm going to tell you this right now, I'm always real careful with these young guys. Um, but, but, but you've got a young man that's entering the mix now in that back end uh, <laughs> in Malachi Starks, who's the biggest, uh, oh, by the way, the fastest um, young man in that room. So uh, you, you add that variable to it as well. So, you know, he was the number one safety in the country last year uh, for a reason because of, uh, you know, projections of what type of athlete he was and what he could do. So you're going to put that young man in that back end mix as well right now. So I think Georgia's got some really good depth there, uh, some really good experience. Chris Smith's not really a burner, but, man, he is very instinctive. Um, you look at the play before Keely Ringo makes the interception and he comes across the field where basically Darian Kendrick was burnt. Uh, on a play, and he comes over the top and knocks a ball down. He comes from across the hash, uh, and that's what you want your safeties to be able to do, things like that. So there's some experience there uh, in that back end. So it would be real interesting how that – what I consider those six or seven guys for those corner stars, nickel, and safety, how that plays out as the season goes on. We'll take a quick break and answer a few more questions when we get back. Before we do that, I would tell anyone watching, make sure to go subscribe to Dogs 247's YouTube channel. Got all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, make sure and do that. You see the link uh, below and also in the chat. Uh, so we'll take a quick break and come let me, back. Let me say one thing, yeah, Jordan, real quick. Uh, uh, just want to thank everybody that are members of Dogs 247, our site. Uh, what a month we had. July was crazy uh, for a dead month. <laughs> it was nuts. Uh, but Kip sent me the numbers, uh, the views we had, the members we have. Never in a million years when this thing started 12 years ago would I thought this place would be like this. Um, it's insane. And thank all you guys that are members are listening. You know, some people right now that might be on Facebook or just watching on YouTube. Give us a try. Spend a couple of bucks this month. If you don't like it, cancel it. You can email. Hey. Be, you can be email and be done in one second. So perfect, perfect timing on that. We got a fifty yeah. percent off promo that just went live for fall camp. So 50%. If you're not a member right now. You, you sign up. You can go dollar first month for the monthly, but mm -hmm. you can get fifty percent off annual subscription of Dogs Two Four Seven right now. So you know yeah. we're gonna have plenty of content for fall camp, and obviously recruiting with official visits is is only gonna get more intense. Mm -hmm. Georgia trying to fill out this class, so perfect time to sign up and. uh Mm -hmm. We'd love to have you guys. Give us a chance. This board say uh, thank you for all of us because it, it was uh, it was an insane July and, and never thought we would have summer views like that and members. So give us a chance, man. But everybody here also subscribe YouTube page. Glad you're here and look forward to season, man. I'm, I'm I'm really pumped about tomorrow. The three of us love what we do, and we couldn't do it if we didn't have your guys' support. So it means yep. the world. So uh, we'll take a quick break and come back and answer a few more questions. Welcome back, everybody. Well, let's go to a question from the live chat. Uh, our guy that's on here, I'm pretty sure every time we, we uh, come on and do a live video, Jordan Harris has a no question. Doubt. No doubt. Uh, uh, Y'all's prediction on leading receiver, pass catcher, and yards, touchdowns on the season. I'll kind of give two answers. As far as pass catchers, I, I, I feel very – uh, you know, I'm very hesitant to say anybody other than Brock Bowers. I think coming off of that <laughs> freshman season, obviously, you know, he was uh, not able to go during the spring because of surgery. Uh, but I think he's going to be ready to go. I think we know that, uh, you know, they're going to be willing to use those tight ends, him and, and Eric Gilbert uh, as well. And, uh, you know, I, I think Brock's ready for a big year. And then of the receivers, I feel like A.D. Mitchell. I think A.D., based on everything we heard during the spring, I think he's set up well 
uh, for a big season. I think he is going to come through. I, I still think that Brock's probably going to lead the way as far as receiving yards and touchdowns, um, but I'm expecting big things from AD as well. Uh, Rusty, what are your thoughts if you got any guys that uh, strike you as could be leading the way? Totally agree with both of those. I don't think I would change anything. Let me give you a little wild card. I don't know. We lose Kip there for a minute. Uh, I'll yeah, give you a wild. He'll he'll probably pop out. <laughs> I'll give you a wild card. Uh, Dominic Blaylock and uh, Dominic is seems to be in the best shape he's been in a couple years now after going through two uh, knee injuries. And I think that um, with Dominic, the ability to separate. And you start talking about a guy in the red zone with great hands. And if you look at how Georgia used him when he was healthy. Uh, he was a really good red zone threat. So if you start talking about a sneaky guy with touchdowns, if Dominic Blaylock stays healthy, you know, he, he might not get all the touches, but this guy could end up with, you know, five or six touchdowns. You think how did that, you know, that kind of came out of nowhere. So you start looking at guys one-on-one -on -one that can win a battle in a short area of the red zone. I think Dominic Blaylock's a guy that you want to kind of keep your eye on. Um, Eric Gilbert is – I mean, he is he's a mismatch. So uh, I'm very interested how Georgia uses Darnell, Eric Gilbert and Brock Bowers, because you, you've got to use that uh, that three headed monster to to kind of uh, create mismatches and those types of things. So be interested to see that. But I would have a hard time choosing anybody but Brock Bowers just because his hands and a quarterback loves a guy that they know just get it anywhere near him. and He's going to make a catch. I've kind of transitioned that question to when we got on the board because one of the guys you named would be part of my answer. A dog blog on our board said, at this time last year, very few people saw Bowers, McConkie, and Bennett as the top performers on offense. Uh, which three players will come out of nowhere this year to be major contributors? I, I could kind of see that second part of the question being on either side of the ball. Blaylock was the guy I immediately thought of because we heard a lot of really good things about him uh, during the spring uh, another answer I had wasn't on uh, offense, but defense, a guy I'm interested in is Smile Munden. I mean, yep. I thought he had a chance to be uh, a, an immediate impact this spring, wasn't able to go because of surgery before spring started. I feel like he's got a chance to maybe work his way in there and, you know, maybe compete for a starting role alongside Jamon Dumas Johnson. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, I was trying to think of a third, but Rusty, any other guys uh, that you think we're not talking about, haven't heard a lot about right now that, we could be looking at the end of the year and, and say someone like Blaylock that you just talked about um, could potentially contribute in a big way. Michael Williams, I think, as the year goes on, you look at a pass rusher, uh, Georgia likes to rotate their pass rushers. And as the year goes on, um, this is a six foot five, 260 pound, 255 pound freshman. Uh, he's only going to get better. And the comparisons with Trayvon Walker are going to come on and on and on because you look at him. I covered both of them. Uh, very similar personalities, you know, just go to work, lunch pail mentality type guys, um, you know, know both of their parents and families and uh, just a lot of similarities there. So, um, you know, I think uh, you look at Michael Williams as the season goes on, I think you check back to Jordan Davis's freshman year, played a little bit coming out of that bye week going into Florida. They inserted him in the lineup and he was kind of he was kind of forever. Uh, in the mixture there at Georgia until he left. A uh, couple questions about Dan Jackson. We did mention Dan Jackson. I think Dan Jackson starts. I think he's got a great chance to start. I mean, he's a guy. He's long. He's fast. He's a four-four. You know, he's he's by far faster than William Poole and Chris Smith and those guys. I mean, he is legit four-four. Um, and I think people get confused and like he's just a walk-on and all that. Don't don't worry about all that. Dan Jackson can play. Uh, it's funny, Dan Lanning. Uh, you know, I ran into Dan Lanning probably a year and a half ago at a, at a coaching clinic. And, man, Dan Lanning, he was kind of the first person ever told me, like, that. listen, we got one. This Dan Jackson kid can play. And lo and behold, his first game uh, as a head coach at Oregon, he's going to be trying to trying to uh, confuse Mr. Dan. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think some people get, get kind of caught up with Dan Jackson being a walk-on, all those type of things. It happens. There's a lot of good players, that, stories like Dan Jackson. And uh, I think he's just – he's a – a valuable asset you saw last year uh, came in. He just got some really, really valuable experience. He's going to be a guy that's going to continue to play a lot uh, for Georgia. Uh, but I think Michael Williams, man, Ty Ingram Dawkins, another name that comes up. I'll say this. Um, I don't know how they're going to do it, but uh, Georgia's going to find a way to play Amarius Mims in some way, fashion, or form because he's just too good to sit on the bench. And 
Uh, I made a note on our, on our board the other day that Marius Mims is in the best shape of his life as being at the University of Georgia. I don't know the percentage that I was told or heard, but he had the leanest body fat by far of anybody in the offensive line room, and I think he weighed 337. So you're talking about a guy that's six foot seven, 337 pounds, and he has the least amount of body fat in that room. That tells you, you know, that guy's a that guy's a different person. So I have a hard time believing that they're not going to find a way to play a Marius Mims, and I think they're going to play a Marius Mims a good bit at some point in this season. Um, even with the guys they got coming back, they're just going to find a way to rotate him in, or find a role, or find a find a um, a lineup to get him in because this guy's a first round draft pick in my opinion and his clock's ticking and you better get some snaps out of him uh, because he'll be gone sooner than later. Yeah. I have no doubt they're going to try to find a way to get the best. And and, and he almost was gone this spring. Yes. So yes, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Go to another question from the board. Uh, Q dog 22 says, which position group concerns you heading into camp? There's two to me, and then I can throw it to you, Rusty. Mm -hmm. They don't really concern me, but there's a couple positions where I just want to see if somebody kind of, you know, steps up. I mean, inside linebacker is one that comes to mind for me. You know, I think Jamon Dumas Johnson, everything we saw from him in the spring, I feel like he's ready to kind of take on that lead role. But who are the guys outside of him? I talked about, uh, you know, Smile Munden a few minutes ago. Savion Sori is another guy that could get in the mix there. They got some young guys coming in as well. EJ Lightsey. Who is going to step up? Because if it's just Jamon, that's going to be a position of concern. Uh, Tresman Marshall, too. Uh, some of those other inside linebackers, Ryan Davis. Uh, who is it that is able to step up alongside of what seems like a really, really promising start for Jamon, just based on everything we heard during the spring? And then I think the other position that kind of strikes me is just receiver, as in, who kind of works their way into the rotation, who plays what roles, uh, you know, and a lot of guys that, you know, I feel like behind, you know, AD, uh, Lad McConkey, uh, Karis Jackson, who are the guys that kind of step up in roles behind them? You know, we talked about Dominic Blaylock, uh, Marcus Rosemi, Jack Singh gets a lot of praise for the way he blocks. Can we see him, uh, you know, becoming a bigger receiving threat? Uh, Jackson Minks is a guy I watched in high school that played really, really well at Central Phoenix City and has made plays, made a few plays in that G-Day game. Who kind of steps up? And then you have the, the freshmen that are coming in as well. Uh, what position groups kind of strike you or kind of stand out as far as the ones that you might have a little bit of concern about or just want to see if guys step up? Well, I'll go with you on inside linebacker for a little different reason because of the calls that those position has to make. I mean, you look at a Kobe Dean, you look at, you know, Channing Tindall and, you know, all those guys, you know, Quay Walker that was so experienced in there, but you lose a guy like Nicobe Dean and what he got people lined up and those type of things at Georgia to play those two inside backer spots for Glenn Schumann, you have so much mentally on you uh, to be able to make those calls and strengths and all those type of things and you do the mismatch coverage and those type of things. So I think athletically Georgia's going to be fine an inside backer. I mean, they've recruited well there. I think it's experience you worry about. You know, can they have a busted coverage, wrong gap, those types of things. Um, then you look at who's the third running back because Georgia rotates backs. You know, uh, obviously Kendall Milton and Kenny McIntosh are going to be the guys. And, uh, you know, who's going to be that third run? It's going to be Dejon Edwards. It's going to be Branson Robinson. Any of these guys going to step up and take that third spot because Georgia likes to play multiple running backs under Dale McGee and keep those guys fresh. And that's what they've always done. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm curious on who kind of steps forward and becomes that third back that keeps the rotation and gets in those minutes uh, uh, as the season goes on. We'll answer a few more questions before we get out of here. I'm going to combine a question from our board and a question from the live chat. Uh, From the live chat, the DGD podcast said, am I crazy to believe the toughest game we will play this year will be at Mississippi State? And then one of the questions we got on our board, uh, hey, look, there's Tim Adams. What's up, guys? There he is. Great. Right in time, we're going to answer this question, Kip. Uh, Someone asked on the live chat if they thought that they were crazy for thinking this year. Uh, one of Georgia's toughest games will be at Mississippi State. 
And then I'm combining this with a question we got from the board, which was a win-loss prediction from all three of us. And if you predict a loss, who is the team? I'll start with me. Uh, I think Georgia goes 12-0 and in the regular season. A lot of it, I mean, I think this team is very talented. I think they've also got a very favorable schedule, and I think that's going to help them out a lot. But to go with that question that was asked in the live chat, I really feel like their chance to lose, if you told me, you know, Georgia, if you told me you're from the future and Georgia went 11-1 and this year, I could see that loss being Mississippi State. I think where it falls in the year, going to be in November. We don't know, obviously, by that point in the year if Georgia's dealing with any injuries. We've seen uh, Mississippi State, especially under Mike Leach, uh, being able to pull off upsets. I think they beat three ranked teams last year. Uh, it's going to be in Starkville. That's the game to me that really stands out when I look at the whole schedule as far as who who really, you know, that game feels like a trap game to me. And, and having it where it falls in the schedule, Mississippi State would be the team that I, I'm very intrigued to see just how Georgia's able to handle that game. I picked Georgia to go 12-0, and 0, and I shouldn't have because the odds are extremely high that that doesn't happen. I mean, um, it's hard to go 12-0 and 0 in college football. And, and it, even, you know, you look at all the years Alabama won the national championship, they had a game. You're like, what happened that game? So I, it was hard for me to get that game. Uh, but I did talk to I, – I did mention on the board last night, I talked to an NFL scout last week, and we were talking about something totally different. And we got talking about sneaky rosters. And he told me one of the sneaky rosters was Mississippi State. And I said, wait a minute. And he goes, I think they got like 17 or 18 returning starters, and this quarterback they got is pretty good. And I thought, oh boy. So you look at you look at things like that. Um, and again, you come off a Tennessee, Florida game, you go to Starkville. Who knows? That's going to be at night. Uh, you know, what where, where you're at mentality, you're late in the year, you're physically beat up. I don't care who you are. It is hard to get up three weeks in a row to run a gauntlet like that. So, I mean, I'm sure that. The Kirby Smart will he he understands that and that stretch when they get to that point. But I'm telling you now that that offense is tough to deal with. You have to be extremely patient. Can't put, you know they'll rub you to death if you play man to man. So you have to play zone. You have to tackle well. You have to pattern match in your routes coverages. I mean it's a lot on a defense against something like that. So um, you know that was the game that I picked Georgia to win last night, but. Just thinking and looking at that that thing, obviously the kind of the national pick is the Tennessee game. Uh, Tennessee, I'm not, I can't, I can't go with Tennessee just yet defensively. I don't know if they can make the stops. That offense is going to be hell to deal with, and boy, they stress you to the max. Uh, I wonder if if somebody breaks the Ole Miss injury record this year against Tennessee. Uh, how many how many cramps they had slowing down Tennessee's offense last year? Georgia had a few of those. Uh, cramps in the fourth quarter if you'll go back and look at that tape as well but uh you know you look at you look at that mississippi state game and you wonder where george is going to be mentally coming into a third week in a row of, of obviously a, a tough sec stretch there with, with tennessee florida i mean florida tennessee and then at mississippi state yeah definitely and then you know for me i the percentages say like you guys say i mean that most teams are going to lose a game. Something's going to happen. I got Georgia going 12 and 0 just because they should go 12 and 0 based on uh, what they bring back, looking at the teams they play. And should and will are two different things. So we're going to predict that because it's what should happen, but we can't, you can't predict the unpredictable. And, you, and yeah, you look at Mississippi State, and one thing you have to, we, we talk about the secondary, and some guys are going to have to step up. Some young guys are going to have to get experience. The fact that it's later in the season. Probably, I mean, it, it, if they're healthy, it actually bodes well for Georgia. Uh, Mississippi State's going to try to dink and dunk and and throw, you know, 40, 50 passes against Georgia. And by then, you know, the secondary will have, you know, taken slumps, but also, you know, just gained some valuable experience and, and gained some confidence. So that should help them. But, you know, co coming off the Tennessee game, between those two games, you know, there's probably going to be close to 100 passes thrown against the secondary in those two games. So we'll know about Georgia's pass defense, you know, after week 11. And then after that, going, at, you know, at Kentucky, Kentucky might be, you know, maybe not the most talented. It might be Oregon, but second, you know, second best team they play. 
but at the same time, that's that's kind of a team that match that Georgia matches up well with, you know, just w- with what they like to do offensively, and they also they 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 like to try to uh, you know play pretty well in the trenches. Uh, I think that even though Kentucky is probably a better team than Mississippi State, uh, that uh, I think that that's a probably a game that Georgia is going to match up well in, and I think you know being on the road. Uh, won't really affect things for Georgia. I just think that the makeup of Georgia's team, the the leadership they have, and the, and the experience that they have on offense, uh, they'll probably be able to go into Lexington and and, and perform pretty well. So I, the schedule matches up really well for Georgia. Uh, that's an interesting stretch, just like you guys said, Florida, Tennessee, and then you know back to back road games against pretty good SEC opponents. I, I think uh, you know we're going to learn a lot about Georgia during that stretch and. Should prepare them pretty well if they're trying to to get to Atlanta and then again return to the college football playoff. Before we get out of here, I feel like we would be remiss not to answer one of the recruiting questions on the live chat. Uh, Start with you, Rusty, and then Kip, you can chime in uh, after that. Brian Bivens just said, Rusty, talk about recruiting a little bit. Right now, Georgia has the third overall class as we go into early August. Just How do you think this has shaped up so far for Georgia and, and what might be coming down the pipe? Georgia had a hell of a July. Now, we're not going to sugarcoat it. They lost Justice Haynes, who I think is the top running back in the country, to Georgia Legacy. We can go on and on and on. And I've said on here, told Kip, I've said on every interview I've done, that was the biggest shocker in my 12 years of covering full-time college recruiting. Uh, I would have – very few times I bet my house on something, I would have bet my house on – Justice Haynes ended up at Georgia, and he told me it was it was Georgia for a long time, and then went to Alabama. And it is what it is. Now, on the flip side of that, Georgia uh, gets Jonel Guerrero, uh, the number two rated safety in the country, and they don't get Caleb Downs. The perception there is, and rightfully so, that you, you look at probably the two top players in the state of Georgia going to Alabama. They were trailing for Caleb Downs for a long, long, long time. Okay, and they closed that gap a lot. And Caleb told me himself that Georgia was in a really good spot after the visit. And so they had done a really good job there to even get that thing close. I think if Fran Brown had been there another cycle, that one could have got a lot more interesting. But what makes it look bad is you got those two guys going to the rival right now of Alabama and the state of Georgia. But if you take those two things out of it right now, Georgia's got a hell of a class, and they're doing a really good job. Um, I, I think that their evaluations right now in the summer, they're doing a really good job of those. Got a call from Steve Wolfong probably about 20 minutes ago, and I don't know if he's put out any news, but he's going to make a crystal ball on a major Georgia target pretty soon. It's going to make a lot of people uh, excited. And I told him, I said, drop that thing. Drop it right now. And he uh, <laughs> Did he make it? Uh, uh, 50 minutes ago, yeah. Okay, good. So he called me a, few, a little while ago, and and you talking about Sam and Pimba, uh, you know, five star outside linebacker at IMG. He thinks Georgia's in a really good spot. Now we both agree that thing is going to go until December, but right now Georgia's in a really good spot for an elite outside linebacker, and that's what Georgia needs to add in his class too, uh, in my opinion. So I, I think when you you know you look at that week of Justice Haynes, and then you top it with Caleb Downs, kind of, you know, Alabama's going to do their thing. And they've been doing their thing. This is not anything new. What's new is they come into the state of Georgia and get the two top players. Uh, And it all kind of magnifies with a player like Justice Haynes. So you take all the other things out of that, uh, and Georgia's got a hell of a class. They got to get – I don't know where they're going running back. I I don't. You know, I I don't because Alabama took Richard Young and Justice Haynes. So Going to the portal. I I think they're going to save one for the – I really do. I think they're going to save one for the portal. I mm-hmm. think I think that Georgia, I would say one if I'm Georgia, you know, and and uh, so the running back stuff there, the, the wide receiver, I think when this class is signed, I think Georgia fans are going to be they're going to be happy with what Brian McClendon done his first year. He's looking for size and he's looking for speed, and he's trying to change that room and it quickly. And I think Brian McClendon, you give him two cycles and he'll do that. So yes, they've taken some losses, uh, but I think right now. Uh, Georgia's in some good spots on some guys, and I think they're going to have a pretty good August. But I think going into football season, Georgia and Kirby Smart are going to do what they've done so far at, under Kirby Smart, no matter who it was, is finished strong. Kip, any additional thoughts just on where recruiting is right now for Georgia? Well, I, I think 
like Rusty said, I'm, I'm looking at the wide receiver position, and george has got a couple guys on board that, you know, are pretty talented guys. Uh, a great start at the position for Brian McClendon. Like Rusty's brought up, I mean, Georgia's getting negatively recruited there. And, the, you know, the only thing you can do about that is is, is try to tell the guys, I mean, you guys can be the ones to change that. We need guys like you. And the, the future of the quarterback position is bright here and, and the offense overall. But they got a couple of guys, Yazid Haynes, they just picked up. And they got Raymond Cottrell as well, who's been on board, gosh, uh, since November now. You know, been been out there and actively recruited for Georgia as well. If they're able to land two other guys, I, I think you got to keep your cap to Brian McClendon. And, and there's some really talented guys that they're in the mix for right now. Anthony Evans, if you're talking about speed, he brings it. You you, you bring a guy like him in there with a Jazid Haynes, and, and you've added a lot of speed to, to this offense. It's just something they've been trying to put on the field for a while. It's a, a guy that can stretch the defense. And I think the key – Tyler Williams out of Lakeland. I think he's underrated. I think the the, uh, the industry has him outside the top 100. I think he's a top 100 player. The things he can do at 6'3", 180 pounds uh, are really impressive. Uh, and so I think that guy's a perfect fit for Georgia's offensive and what they want to do. And, he, you know, he's a guy that can come in and, and really uh, be highly productive if Georgia's able to land him out of Lakeland, Florida. And I think, you know, they're in a pretty good spot for him. Announcing in September, I believe, at this time, if they're able to get him, uh, I think that's a huge win for Brian McClendon. And I think that class overall w- would be an outstanding first group for him. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Appreciate everybody for uh, watching and asking questions, tuning in, like Rusty talked about earlier, supporting us at, at Dogs247, uh, hearing from all you guys and, and being able to, uh, to bring you guys the latest on the Bulldogs, we all love to do it. And uh, very excited to to have a chance to answer your questions, let you guys know what's going on. Make sure, again, before I get out of here, to plug that uh, Dogs247 YouTube channel. Make sure and go subscribe to it. Uh, so we'll get out of here on that. Thanks again to Rusty and Kip taking some time to pop on here with me and answer some questions. Going to be a busy week, but uh, we're ready for it. Excited to get back to the grind. Excited for fall camp to get going on Thursday. So uh, we're going to get out of here on that. Thanks, everybody, for watching, tuning in. Make sure and subscribe and and rate and tell everybody about the podcast. Uh, Until next time, take care.